You're watching Double Standards with me, Afshin Rotensi. It's 67 years to the day since Churchill, Roosevelt and Stalin divided the world at Yalta. This week, we look at American institutions continuing to divide the world. Coming up in the show, the boss of James Bond, the world's most famous spy, admits that the British government uses this to eavesdrop on the Russians. Who is recruiting agents to bomb Pakistan and Iran? Is it this channel, the CIA, Mossad? And we talk to Amma Marston, who worked with former World Bank chief economist Joseph Stiglitz about why, well, why you should never trust the World Bank. Welcome to Double Standards, now banned in Britain along with the rest of this channel. Who knows what dirty tricks in the war on Iran are next? You know how the British security services want you to think working at MI6 is all like this. Ah, yes. Uh, satellite receiver, tracking device, uh, Semtex chewing gum. Ah, uh, now, what did I just say? Oh. <laughs> <laughs> But actually, despite Tony Blair lying about it at the time, it was more like this. Hmm. The rock was the size of a football and contained wireless communications gear. The device acted as a high-tech dead letter drop. An asset could upload information to the rock. An agent could then later download the information. Russian security found and monitored the device's activity before seizing it. They used one of these, very sophisticated. Is this a piece of moon rock? That's one small step for man. Turns out, thanks to Blair's chief of staff, Jonathan Powell, we know MI6 used rocks to spy on Russians. Here is the journalist that broke the original story, which at the time was denied. At first, I had some doubts. I thought it might be a fake story or a political game. But we cross-checked everything with multiple sources, and it turned out to be true. Some footage we didn't include in the film was particularly convincing. For example, there was a video of a British spy urinating in front of the camera. The camera was hidden under a tree and the stone was lying nearby. The guy wanted it to look natural, so he pretended that he needed to take a leak, and he peed right in front of the camera before picking up the stone and leaving. Urinating. Perhaps it is all part of NATO training. We all saw this on our TV screens recently. You've also had to be diplomats and development workers and trainers and peacemakers. Through all this, you have shown why the United States military is the finest fighting force in the history of the world. And what happens when a U.S. soldier gets caught ordering the deaths of civilians? U.S. military prosecutors called the court-martial of Marine Staff Sergeant Frank Ruderich the last chance for justice in the mass killing of 24 Iraqis in the town of Haditha in 2005. But on Monday, Ruderich, who was charged with manslaughter, pleaded guilty to negligent dereliction of duty. Now he faces a maximum of three months in prison and a rank demotion. A military statement says, Staff Sergeant Wooderich accepted responsibility for his actions and will now be held accountable for those actions. Wooderich had ordered his unit to shoot the civilians after a roadside bomb killed a member of their convoy. The victims included women, children, and an elderly man in a wheelchair. Three months for Staff Sergeant Frank Wooderich for ordering the killing of 24 Iraqi civilians and acquittals for all the other soldiers involved in the Haditha massacre. That America would claim democracy and human rights to kill children? They are mocking Iraqi blood, and they are mocking us as well. But in between torture and the murder of civilians, the secret services of the U.S. and Israel still found time to recruit here in London. Uh, well, that's recruitment to the BBC for the British propaganda channel against the Iranian government. I think this was slightly different. 
CIA memos describe how Mossad agents posed as U.S. intelligence agents to make contact with a Pakistani organization known as Jindallah. Members of the group, which is on the U.S. terrorist list, were then recruited to launch attacks on targets within Iran. Great. So Jandala, Mossad, and the CIA all together like one happy family. There are some who now suspect outside forces to be involved in what is happening in Syria. Would you be in favor of Arab nations intervening in Syria? I think for, for such a situation to stop the killing, we have some, some troops should go to stop the killing. Qatari troops in Syria to fight the Syrian government. Who is Qatar friends with these days? The Taliban have struck a deal to open an office in Qatar. At least the Qatari proposal may lead to talks, unlike the U.S. policy of drone strikes on Afghan civilians. But what about the plight of workers in Qatar as they build the infrastructure for the 2022 FIFA World Cup? They haven't been paid in four months. They're not even treating us as human beings because they are not giving us our salaries. Tech came to Doha so he could send his children to school and pay for his wife's medical treatment. He took out a bank loan to finance his trip here. Every day that I work, I get more and more tense. I think about how I will pay for my debt, the school fees, and my wife's doctor. All of these men have similar responsibilities. They took a gamble on Qatar and mortgaged their land to come here. Both their families and their bankers are waiting for the money to be transferred home. More about Qatar and human rights at the end of the show. Al Udaid Air Base, west of Doha in Qatar, is the headquarters of U.S. Central Command. I wonder how America cares for the rights of its own soldiers. What happens, say, when they die and are repatriated to Arlington National Cemetery? And now we know that the problems with the graves at Arlington may be far more extensive than previously acknowledged. At a conservative estimate, 4,900 to 6,600 graves may be unmarked improperly marked or mislabeled on the cemetery's maps. It's inexcusable. I just, there's, this is some place where heroes are buried and you take better care of them than that. So that's how Obama treats American veterans when they die. Next, they'll be sending them here. At least they may get their details, right? Hoping to find affordable rates on a clean, modern storage unit? Bring your things to Arlington Self Storage and find all the conveniences and amenities you're looking for. Now it's time for comedian David Mulholland to cast his eye over the latest cartoons from around the world. Hi, Afshin. It's good to be back. It's the anniversary of Yalta, Churchill, Stalin, some American FDR also there, I think. Uh, it only took us a few years to iron out that uh, division of the, of the world. And uh, we live in peaceful times now. No, this cartoon uh, no, says no, not different. so peaceful. No, uh, no. As as you can see in this cartoon, uh, well, I mean, what we're seeing is what's sounding like possibly the drums of war again. And in this cartoon, you see uh, Uncle Sam sitting there, is uh, digging down, saying, "I think I'm starting to see the light at the end of the tunnel." And you've got Iraq, Afghanistan, Pakistan, and now you have Iran, which is the light IRA, at the end of the tunnel. It says, Iran. It's Iran. It's supposed to be Iran. Mm. And uh, here you have this little guy down here. What? Australia? Keep digging down, hit Australia. Uh, what's funny about that is... We better uh, tell Gillard, that Welsh uh, Prime Minister of Australia. The well, US may invade. <laughs> no, you can't actually... Anyway, um, won't explain the idea of globe digging. Anyway, the, uh, the, but what's funny about Australia, I mean, what, was, what this is really about is what's going on with Iran right now. All and options are on the table, said Obama at yeah, the Yeah, all uh, options State on the, the table, which is a way of... of uh, Macho? Basically, the Republicans would love another war because they love wars. Our next cartoon from Honduras, the country yes. that uh, the Obama administration first overthrew the uh, legitimate government of in the first uh, year. Was it the second year Obama overthrew the government of Honduras? But anyway, what does the cartoon mean? Uh, anyway, uh, this is all about the SOPA. Uh, provisions going to the U.S. Congress, and this is uh, basically internet censorship. And this is Uncle Sam chasing after a guy who's who's got some DVDs and going, "Oh, it's piracy! It's piracy!" The little but guy. Hold, yeah, the little guy being a pirate. Now, hold on a moment. Piracy, really? Piracy? I mean, th as far as I'm concerned. Uh, copying DVDs and films and, and that sort of thing, I, it may be wrong, but it's not murdering, raping, and pillaging, which is what I think of as piracy. It is to some executives in some uh, pretty posh clubs in London. They'll tell you how painful it is. And you yes. know it's the anniversary of Facebook. I think Mark Zuckerberg has stolen my uh, entire identity. 
But anyway. It's all in your, you had an identity before Facebook? Yes, exactly. That seems to be the way people are looking at it. But China laughing at this basically yes. is unenforceable and Congress not really understanding how the Internet works, which is odd because the U.S. kind of invented it. Yes. Or the Defense Department did. And NASA. Uh, and here you have, this is all about fracking. And here it says, Sorry? the second fracking. I'll explain in a minute. Uh, it's saying the second coming of petroleum. And here it says, free gasoline straight from the tap. Uh, showering every Pennsylvanian with unexpected bounty, being oil, uh, turning every home into a potential gasoline station. And, uh, and they say, who said oil and water don't mix? And this is about a technique for freeing up natural gas out of shale. Obama loves this, doesn't he? He mentioned well, this there's in the State problems. of the Union It's, a, it's well. a technology that was developed by that, that wonderful company that always does good things, Halliburton. And what they do is they pump trillions of gallons of water with toxic chemicals mixed into it, pump it into the ground at very high pressures, and it fractures all the shale. You keep pumping it down, and gas comes up, and then you sell off the gas, and in the process, pollute the groundwater, and in the case of Ohio, create earthquakes in places there are no faults. Obama scientists say it's a brilliant technological innovation that will save the United States of America. Although there was that Youngstown earthquake on New Year's Eve. We don't yeah. know whether it was caused by fracking in fairness. Yeah, but we? they've never had an earthquake before. Your next cartoon is Poor Captain. Yes, yes. This is about the Costa Concordia and the captain. What? Uh, Obviously, people died on that boat. We should give uh, yes. condolences to that before you start. Uh, yes, and here you have the, the captain saying, I repeat, women and children first. The thing is, is that the captain, he... Um, you wanted him story. to die. No. The mainstream media here wanted this captain to no, die. There's an internationally, captains of ships stay on the ships to help with the evacuation. Now, the captain of the Titanic stayed on board the ship, helping the captain of the, the Costa Concordia. He apparently tripped, fell into a lifeboat, which then went away from the ship. And then when the Italian Coast Guard came out, repeatedly said, get back onto the ship, Instead get back onto the ship. He went, no, it's dark. Look, face it. If you're afraid of the dark, you shouldn't be captaining a ship. Instead of blaming this poor man, I think we should be blaming the massive cruise companies that are building bigger and bigger ships, not thinking about the environment they're in. And also, why was this ship flagged for Panama, a big U.S. ally? Why aren't they actually flagged for the countries that they're actually uh, in the ports of those countries? They're uh, that's tax? a different issue. No, it's because it's cheap to. I just wonder about the control of these boats. Um, this this next cartoon is it's really about the uh, about the economy and and Europe and it's saying no reason to worry we'll continue on the same route with even more resolve and you have headless chickens running and then falling over a cliff and this is in fact what i see happening across the world in a lot of governments now saving the euro and saving the eurozone and stopping Greece from defaulting, which right now economists think will happen in a couple of weeks. We're in recession here now. We're in recession here. And the IMF is looking at it that if we don't turn around the situation right now, that it looks like we're going to have in the eurozone, we're going to have two consecutive years of 4% economic contraction. That will bring the rest of the world down with it. And the entire world will go back into a recession with shrinking economies. What entire world? The developing world has never done better. Look at Venezuela. Growth, no, actually, no actually, their growth is falling growth. off as well. Falling off? Yeah. We don't even know what growth is in Britain. I mean, the, it's when things get bigger. What is bad growth for China? What is bad 10%? growth? 10%? Anyway, here we go. Read this one out. Yes, here you have uh, tax the rich, tax the rich, tax the rich. And you have Wall Street saying, tax the witch? Corporate America, fax the pitch? The media, wax the niche? And then you, you, someone guy. Yeah, that doesn't saying, work. We pronounce it niche. Americans pronounce it niche. I think. Yeah, well, anyway, it rhymes. Yeah. It's an American cartoon. And uh, saying, uh, I wish those Occupy people had a con coherent message. And yes, well, they do have a coherent message. And what they're saying is raise taxes on the rich. I mean, that's essentially what they're saying. I mean, the, the big thing that's been taxes. happening across the, the Western world is with the economy no. is that rich people don't pay taxes and they've crashed the economy. No one seems to want to follow that policy at all. I know that the, uh, uh, the royalty over here and uh, the rest of the rich people in this country, mm. I mean, they're not giving the diamonds back that we said from Bahrain uh, in last week's episode. And as for policy, 
Generally, we don't want to uh, tax the rich because the World Bank, the IMF, these institutions say never tax the rich. Well, the best I've thing never is heard of anyone poor. in the World Bank and the IMF actually saying that. What I have heard is people like David Cameron and George Osborne and Republicans in the U.S. Congress saying, oh, oh, oh the, the, if, you, if you tax them, that's class war. Taxing rich people is class warfare. No, it's not. It's making everyone pay the same. When you had uh, David Cameron saying, we're all in this together, what he meant is, we're all in this together. We all pay tax. Well, we don't pay taxes, but we you pay taxes. That makes us all in this together. No, it's time for everyone to start pulling their weight. Well, I mean, David, we've David the politics Cameron, of division. David Cameron and David Miliband both worship the World Bank and the IMF, and I think their policies are different in terms of only a percentage, five percentage points of GDP. That's all they argue about down there. Anyway, thanks a lot, David Mulholland, for coming Thank you, Afshin. If you look up World Bank and scandal on Google News, it's pretty difficult to know where to start. There are just so many scandals associated with the wretched institution, along with its sister organization, the IMF. There are problems in Kenya, where $400,000 has gone missing, problems in the Philippines, where another quarter of a million dollars has gone on something called a judicial reform support project. And as for India, well, over to Bollywood star Abai Dayol. There are many reasons why we're here, and the people are just one of the reasons, one of the most crucial reasons that we're here for. They, they're basically asking for the things that you and me ask for. They're saying that, well, we were pretty well settled in this uh, land of theirs, where they farmed. Uh, when the corporates came in to mine for coal, uh, they promised them jobs. On the pretext of that, they gave up their land. The jobs never came, and policies keep changing. So when they can't deliver the jobs, they say, well, we'll just give you some money. Um, I don't know why people would think that people like them would agree for that because they know that the money, whatever they get, will eventually run out. What then? Because if it, they're saying that we could just make do with the land, don't give us any money. As long as we have a land, we can farm, we can work. He's saying that I have three brothers. If we don't have jobs, at least we have the land to work on. Now we don't even have that. They're saying that they're forest dwellers. They can go into the forest and as they were pointing out the tree, they said there was enough sustenance to even live and get by life without having a job. But after that is taken over, what then? Where will they go? Where indeed? We spoke to Amma Marston, an aid consultant who has worked with former World Bank chief economist Joe Stiglitz and former UN High Commissioner for Human Rights Mary Robinson about how the World Bank continues to force capitalist policies on Singroli in India and right around the developing world. Amma Marston, welcome to the show. Let's begin with your uh, piece that you've written for the Bretton Woods uh, organization, the Bretton Woods Project here. We've had uh, people from there on before, but you're, normally on this program we talk about the uh, macro level analysis of World Bank and IMF policy over decades, let alone over the past weeks. You've, you've really studied one in particular. Just tell us a little bit about it. Well, it's a pleasure to be here with you today and also to have an opportunity to convey some of the messages from communities that I met with on the ground in Singroli, India. Um, I think the main message really to convey is that 20 years after World Bank investments, Singroli, India is still suffering from the initial coal investments that the bank made. And although those investments ended um, in the late 90s, it's opened up generations of coal investments and um, subsequent um, relocation of people, which has never been um, fixed, uh, massive amounts of pollution, water use, uh, water misuse. So, you know, the message is that even though the World Bank has not been in the picture for years, they've had this lasting footprint, um, which has left very negative impacts. Let's go to the World Bank in a second, but first of all, surely the companies that uh, took advantage of that World Bank money say they did increase employment in that area, uh, despite uh, the pollution and other side effects of their, that World Bank loan. It's interesting that you raise the issue of employment um, because people in the area said we willingly gave up our land. It was a question of national development and we were proud to do that. But we were given very few jobs. Um, many of us had to fight for those jobs. So does a World Bank man appear with a little briefcase to this tiny village and say, here's how many, how much money is it? How much money are we talking about? It was. It will sound small to us now, but at the time it was one of the largest loans of its time. So in 1977 it was $150 million, and then there were subsequent loans, renewals um, in the 80s. And then they leave them to it? Has there been no uh, 
uh, come back of the World Bank have sent people to monitor these projects? Um, there was a complaint from the communities in 1997 that went to the World Bank's inspection panel or, or complaint mechanism saying, you know, people's homes have been destroyed, there's police repression and brutality for those who are protesting. So there was this case that was brought and the World Bank had to investigate it. Um, essentially what they found is that the World Bank senior management had pushed through the loans despite World Bank people internally saying there are environmental and social concerns here. So Why would they do that? to make it look as though they're moving projects forward. Maybe there were some special interests. Since you were actually on the ground in this village, what do villagers think of uh, these far off people in Washington DC at the World Bank as to how they make their strategies and decisions? Um, I think there's a great sense of disillusionment. These are big businessmen far away and they don't see that for me as an individual this is my life which has been destroyed and I have nothing to provide the next generation. There's no land to give them, there are no jobs, there are all sorts of unusual illnesses due to the um, increased level of pollution. Development doesn't mean leaving huge groups of people behind. The World Bank's energy lending um, as it stands, only focuses on access to energy for the poor in 9% of its lending. That's not good enough. Chief economists at the World Bank have changed their views very uh, famously uh, since leaving it. Did they not make any changes to decision making? Uh, some people said, okay, we acknowledge our mistakes. Of course, it's been in the news more because of sexual harassment and rape charges at its sister institution, the IMF. Do you see very little change there, or are you hopeful that there is going to be change at the World Bank and, and the IMF? I have seen very little change in the few years that I've worked on it, which is disconcerting. I think there are good people with good intentions inside the institution, but the culture of the institution doesn't seem to be changing quickly enough to keep up with the greatest problems of our times, whether it be access to energy for the poorest or whether it be issues like climate change. Many of our viewers, I would think, would be surprised about the privatization strategy. If one looks at the World Bank website, they seem to have tempered their obsession with neoliberal economics. In fact, I've just been reading that the World Bank, despite having troubles with it years back, with water privatization, is coming back around to pushing water privatization and using it as a model. In Latin and Central America, those that opposed uh, projects, private monopolies, some allied to those institutions, have faced, uh, faced physical harm, sometimes death. What's your next report, and are you frightened that if you keep making reports about <laughs> places uh, uh, that low down, I mean, that micro level, you yourself may be in danger? I think the reality is the concern should be for those that are living in these areas day in and day out and are fighting for their survival and their basic existence and don't have the benefit of being linked to an international organization or being invited into the public eye on a show like yours. Okay, thank you very <laughs> much for coming on the show. Thank you. And we now hear the World Bank says everything is okay in Yemen. It's opening an office in the capital, Sana'a. Violence has erupted in the Yemeni capital, Sana'a, as knife and baton wielding supporters of President Ali Abdullah Saleh clashed with students protesting against his 32 year rule. As for the US backed dictator Ali Abdullah Saleh himself, he's out of there and enjoying legal immunity and private health care, courtesy of President Obama. That's it for this week. You can email us at comment at doublestandardstv.com. Well, we have all heard about Syria in the mainstream media lately. And remember, we told you about Qatar condemning Syria for poor human rights. Well, let's look at conditions for workers in Qatar, in the city chosen to host the FIFA World Cup in 2022. See you next week. I was nine years old when I first saw a maid being beaten by her employer. I still remember how she cried as her hair was pulled and she was violently punched in the chest. And this wasn't the only abuse I witnessed. I'd frequently see housemates, some as young as 15, being yelled at and called racist names by their employers. When I was 14, I began paying attention to news stories about migrant workers here in the Middle East. Headline after horrifying headline, maid commits suicide, construction workers starve to death, made beaten, driver killed, yet little is being done about it. A vast sea of foreigners pour into the Gulf to work as manual laborers, domestics and drivers. Saudi Arabia alone absorbs half a million housemates per year who have left their worlds behind to work for complete strangers 
who are free to abuse them or even choose not to pay them. There have been literally hundreds of thousands of cases of unpaid salaries. Enticed by the promises of good wages, many go into debt to paying fees to crooked job recruiters, only to find wages so low it will take them decades to break even. Some employers confiscate their passports, making returning home impossible even if they have the money. This amounts to modern day slavery, and it makes me feel depressed and helpless, but most of all ashamed that this has been taking place year after year right in my very neighborhood. Migrant workers in the Middle East are undervalued, exploited, and denied basic human rights. While so many of us have turned blind eyes to this situation, thousands of migrant workers have been living in squalid labor camps or languishing in the households of abusive employers, their spirits broken and without hope of ever again seeing their families.